This is a mechanism of disease map for deep vein thrombosis, or DVT. I'll be talking about the many etiologies, including Virchow's triad and a bunch of examples for everything within Virchow's triad, the pathophysiology of DVT, as well as some notes on pharmacology and how anticoagulants like warfarin and heparin affect this pathway. The manifestations of DVT will be discussed at the end, as well as some complications that can result from deep vein thrombosis. All of these boxes are color-coded according to these core concepts listed in the table up top. And I'll be clearing each of these boxes and going through them one by one. So let's get started. The central theory behind the etiology of DVT can be summarized into Virchow's triad. That is, DVTs are caused by some combination of venous stasis, endothelial injury, or hypercoagulable state. And I've listed a lot of things that can be categorized under each of these groupings. So some example of venous stasis are varicose veins, bed rest, immobility, such as somebody who might be bedridden after an injury or after a trauma or surgery, and long travel. This could be a plane ride or a car ride for more than five or so hours will put you at risk for venous stasis causing DVTs. Endothelial injury, you can have a direct injury to the endothelium after trauma, like a motor vehicle accident. Indwelling catheters, like a central line that's been in for too long, can cause endo endothelial injury. Recent surgeries, where the surgeon might actually have been manipulating the veins or the vasculature. Infections can cause endothelial injury. Any type of chronic disease can also cause an inflammatory state that injures the endothelium. Prior venothromboembolisms can cause endothelial injury. And smoking has been shown to be inflammatory and cause endothelial injuries. Lastly, the biggest group is hypercoagulable state. There are several conditions that make a person's blood hypercoagulable. There are some inflammatory diseases like lupus and inflammatory bowel disease that includes ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Being young predisposes you to being hypercoagulable. Um, that's under 50 years old. I think this is mainly because um, women in their reproductive years tend to have higher estrogen and higher progesterone. And as we'll see, those can increase your um, procoagulant proteins. There are some irritable and genetic causes of hypercoagulable blood. This includes thrombophilias like factor V Leiden. Strokes can make you hypercoagulable. Having cancer can change the metabolism of your body and make you hypercoagulable. Nephrotic syndrome has an interesting mechanism here. You're actually losing your antithrombic factors through the kidney. So in nephrotic sy uh, syndrome, you're peeing out a lot of your protein and you're unable to retain some of those proteins. And some of those proteins um, actually break down clots, antithrombic factors. So when you lose the antithrombic factors, you're gonna be in a hypercoagulable state in nephrotic syndrome. Obesity, pregnancy, and oral contraceptive pills are all at the end of this list. And this is because they increase estrogen or estrogen and progesterone. Um, fat tissue, adipose tissue, and obesity produces estrogen. And of course, progesterone, sorry, progesterone is, pre is present in pregnancy and, um, and in some oral contraceptive pills. And uh, estrogen and progesterone increase prothrombin, increase fibrinogen, and decrease the anticoagulant protein S. In any case, you end up with one of these causes of Virchow's triad. And I'll next kind of discuss how these lead to the coagulation cascade. So first, a few notes on the coagulation cascade. It's made up of an intrinsic pathway that starts with surface contact with collagen, calicrine, and HMWK. The extrinsic pathway, which leads to direct damage to the endothelial tissue and exposure of tissue factor. And it kind of ends together in the common pathway, where you end up with a fibrin clot at the end of this. Now, how exactly does Virchow's triad tie into the coagulation cascade? And that's what's described here. So for endothelial injury, it's kind of obvious. If you're damaging the endothelium, if somebody's manipulated a vein or broken a vein, you're either going to expose collagen and start down the intrinsic pathway, or you'll have damage to the endothelial tissue and have tissue factor that leads to the extrinsic pathway. So that one's a little easier to understand. Venous stasis and hypercoagulable state essentially lead to an imbalance in the proteins involved in this coagulation cascade. Now the coagulation cascade has both procoagulant and anticoagulant factors. So for instance, if you have venous stasis, you might have an accumulation of procoagulant factors, and that can lead to your blood clotting and causing a DVT.
Um, hypercoagulable states can be either case. You can either have an accumulation of procoagulant factors or you could have a shortage of anticoagulant factors. But in any case, you have an imbalance that um, leads to a clot and that can enter kind of through the intrinsic pathway or through the common pathway. Now, the end of the common pathway, as I mentioned, is you have a stable fibrin clot. And that, of course, leads to the generation of a thrombus. The most common place to have a DVT is in the lower extremity proximal deep veins. So there's a lot of words here. Lower extremity means your legs. So this typically happens in your legs. The proximal section of your legs. So not really below the knee. They typically happen at the knee or above. And the deep veins. So this means veins that are not close to the skin, veins that are deeper toward the center of your leg, away from the skin. And that's where DVTs tend to form. Now, before we talk about the manifestations of DVT, and there are a few things we want to mention here, um, let's talk briefly about the pharmacology and how anticoagulant medicines kind of enter this pathway and help treat for DVTs. Before we do that, D-dimers, real quick, come from here, and you might see those on labs. Okay, back to pharmacology. So warfarin is a very common oral anticoagulant, and that enters the pathway by blocking epoxide reductase of vitamin K. So this is going to decrease factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, as well as decrease protein CNS. So warfarin will have a direct blocking effect on the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. And fenprocumon is a medicine that's like warfarin and will act similarly. Next, we see that we have thrombin in the intrinsic pathway and in the common pathway here. And heparin and kind of the family of heparins are all drugs that are blocking the effects of thrombin in different ways. So heparin is the biggest of these molecules. There's also low molecular weight heparin, also called enoxaparin. And then there's an even smaller version called fondaparinox. And then dabigatran is a new oral direct thrombin inhibitor. So all of these drugs just block thrombin directly, and thrombin is involved in these parts of the pathway. We also have these new fancy um, oral anticoagulants that directly block factor XA. So this is a pixaban and rivaroxaban. And you'll notice that factor 10 is in the intrinsic pathway. So when you're blocking factor 10, you're blocking the intrinsic pathway here. And this is, um, the, it's, it's easy to remember these because a pixaban and rivaroxaban both have the letters XA in them. Lastly, in a more acute case, you might use ultiplase, also called TPA and TPA stands for tissue plasminogen activator. This causes this reaction in the body. Plasminogen gets converted into plasmin, and plasmin directly breaks down a clot. Um, and in some cases, it can cause bleeding if you're breaking down fibrin clots um, when you don't want to. So it's really a risk-benefit analysis whenever you're deciding to use ultiplase or any other clot-busting drugs like TPA. Now that we got the pharmacology out of the way, let's get into the manifestations of DVTs. You can get a bunch of symptoms from a DVT, and these typically happen unilaterally. It'd be very unusual for somebody to have these symptoms in both legs, since it's very unlikely to have a DVT in both legs occurring at the same time. But first, the most common symptom is probably leg swelling. You might also have leg tightness, leg heaviness, and the patient can have a fever as well, especially if there's an inflammatory etiology to the DVT. Patients can have pain in their legs. Usually it's described as a dull pain that gets worse when they start walking or using that leg and elevating the leg might make it a little better. There's also a sign, a clinical physical exam sign called Homan's sign. It's when you have calf pain on dorsal flexion of the foot. So that might also help you identify a DVT. The lab test, the imaging test you wanna do for a DVT is actually a lower extremity venous ultrasound. And you might see a description that looks like this. It might be a non-compressible obstructed vein, an intraluminal hyperechoic mass, or distension of the affected vein. If you have Doppler available, Doppler sees the blood flow and kind of the speed of blood flow going through the veins, they might say that you have an absent or abnormal venous flow, inadequate augmentation of venous flow with distal calf compression or Valsalva maneuver might also be described on the Doppler report. Now, of course, a DVT um, is a problem, and it can lead to downstream complications that make it even worse. The best known of these is probably the pulmonary embolism. This happens when the DVT travels to the lungs and includes the pulmonary arteries and or arterioles. Pulmonary embolism can then cause all of these symptoms. You can have shortness of breath or dyspnea, you can have chest pain, you can have dizziness, and you can have weakness. 
Another complication arises when a patient has a patent foramen ovale. This is kind of a hole in your heart that's supposed to close as your heart develops into maturity. But if your heart does not close and you end up throwing a DVT up towards your heart, you can actually end up with a stroke. So the DVT starts in your veins and it's actually able to pass from the left side of your heart to the right side of your, sorry, the other way around, from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart and end up in your systemic circulation. If it goes up to your brain, you can end up with a stroke and have stroke symptoms. This includes numbness and weakness of the extremities, confusion, difficulty speaking, difficulty hearing and understanding someone else, or a visual deficit. So stroke symptoms in somebody that had a DVT is very, very concerning for stroke. One last complication involves a DVT that kind of gets mixed in with bacteria. So DVT plus bacteria equals superative thrombophlebitis. And this is a, it's, 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 it's essentially an infectious process now and you'll have to do blood tests and try to identify the, the agent and start the patient on antibiotics. This is uh, usually in people that have like another predisposing factor like an indwelling catheter or maybe IV drug use. Um, some reason for bacteria to get into the bloodstream. Another cause is infective endocarditis. So if they have a reason to have bacteria in the blood, like IV drug use, indwelling catheter, or infective endocarditis, and they have a DVT, it can turn into superlative thrombophlebitis. That's it for this uh, flowchart. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.